Welcome to the Black Doctors Talk podcast. I am Dr. Christopher Holmes, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Today, I am joined by Dr. Steven Johnson. He is a former army officer, a certified educator, musician, professor, director of bands and marching units for the Savannah Chatham County Public School Systems. He's also an entrepreneur. He's a founder, he's a leader and so much more. Guys, please help me in welcoming Dr. Steven Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited about this interview. Uh, you speak my language, which is the language of music. So I can't wait for you to share uh, with the viewers and the listeners. So let's just jump right in and talk a little bit about your background. Where does it all begin for you? Okay. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Born and raised there. Um, I started playing trombone in the second grade. The reason why I did that is because I had a little bit of history in my brothers. I have uh, two older brothers and a younger brother. My older brothers uh, and I uh, have couple, two uncles that are our age, grew up with us, uh, my mom's brothers. Um, they were all in the band. They all started in the band in third grade. And they were actually in New Orleans marching parades and doing the whole bit. I mean, a serious band marching back. And uh, I couldn't wait until it was my turn. And then when they got to high school, you know, of course, I was in elementary going to getting ready to go to middle. You know, that trombone, I fell in love with it. I had two uncles that played trombone. No, about three uncles. Two of my mother's brothers and one of my dad's brothers played the trombone. Uh, my grandfather, a paternal grandfather, he was in the traveling gospel choir uh, called uh, the Gospel Travelers. <laughs> so believe it or not, and my, uh, my paternal, uh, maternal grandfather, he played a little bit of banjo and harmonica. Mostly, mostly a porch musician, but he was all into, he was the president of a benevolent society in, uh, down there in LJ's uh, New Orleans Oakdale Society. And uh, that's like a social aid and pleasure club. If you ever heard of like the Zulus down there, it's something like that. Um, and also he was a, a worshipable master of his uh, lodge with the mates. so he was a society guy. And we would experience you know like the large crowds and stuff when they were having uh, activities and events and that excited me and my brothers and uh, and my two uncles it was five of us that always hung together uh, while in the band they all uh, inspired me to want to do more so i learned i would learn my instrument but i'll learn more from them on their particular instruments okay um after that i went on um i joined actually when i was in middle school i was like the best player um, in the school. Well, I was all city and all, all city band in elementary, but I was able to get invited to march with the high school band. And then, um, and I actually did that, did that for some years. And then I started professionally. Band director that at the time, he put together a group of, uh, had, the, and the musicians were all grown ups in terms of the piano player, but keyboard player, bass guitar, and stuff like that, the guitar and drummer. But then he was some uh, guys my age. We were uh, the entertainers. Like you had three uh, singers and dancers that sang and danced. That basically the Jackson Jackson review. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we had the horn section. And I was 13 years old when I started professionally. We got paid, we got paid a lot of money. We did we did shows and stuff, uh, talent shows. We even did a lot of parties and got paid. I started traveling when I was age 16 around like to uh, when I joined the jazz programs and stuff around the country, United States, and started going abroad, you know, to Europe and stuff like that. At 16? 16. Wow. Between 16 and 17, I was gone, you know, doing a lot. Started a band of my own, uh, a jazz band in 10th grade uh, for my nickname. My nickname is Steven. My, my nickname, which is also my trade name now, Steven Cool Bone Johnson. Oh, <laughs> and that's C-O-O-L-B-O-N-E. Uh, the group I started was called Cool Bone, Cool Bone Jazz and Cool Bone Brass Band, where we were doing the performances while I was in high school. My band director, we would have like the marching band performances. This is another band director because I went to another school. Uh, and when they're doing the big events like conventions in New Orleans, because everybody want to do their convention and their party and their stuff in New Orleans, we would do these mighty, mighty, mock Mardi Gras things. So he would have my little group come out and do uh, outside of the big band, we would do our little thing too. 
to represent the New Orleans second line bands. Um, after that, my group started hitting. We were doing like sit down jazz. I got me a, a right, upright, upright bass player, piano player, drummer, and I had the strolling brass band. Cool Bone Jazz still exists today wow. in a couple of chapters. There's a chapter in New Orleans. There's a chapter in Dallas. There's a chapter in Huntsville, Alabama. And the reason why, because with Hurricane Katrina in 2005, I moved to uh, Huntsville, Alabama and started teaching there, connected with uh, two, my two middle school theater directors. I was a high school director there. Uh, put them in cool bones, started taking them uh, uh, to the other continents and other countries. And then we trained students. When those students uh, got a little older, we put them, the, the students that the three of us taught, all three of us, um, in that groups with us. And so that's why there's a Huntsman chapter. But uh, it all started there. Uh, I became a music educator. I went to the Army for a while. I majored in music, got a Bachelor of Arts at Dillard University. And then uh, I got a Master's of Organizational Management, Master's of Arts and Organizational Management at University of Phoenix in the classroom, but it wasn't even online or anything in New Orleans. And then I got a, a Doctor of Management and Organizational Leadership uh, more recently. Um, the reason why I did chose those, because I've always been a leader. I've always been a musician. As far as I can, if anybody can remember, they'll tell you, I was had a trombone strapped to my back or I had in my hand playing. So I wanted to put the two days together. I, I was leading groups. I, uh, I had another group that I helped found and start uh, first year college. That group still exists today. And these groups have had major labor deals. Wow. So what I did, but I put these, I wanted to put my management skills of what I knew that I learned in the music business together with my performance skills. And that's why I, I chose to manage uh, to major in the music and then also in the business areas, the management areas. And uh, and it so far it, you know, it worked out. Wow. You know, I did I did the like I said, the major labor deals and uh, pr brought a lot of people into the uh, the business and got some Grammy winners and everything else on that. <laughs> Now I'm gonna I'm gonna throw in this shameless plug. So by the time we end, I would love to hear a little something if you got the trombone mm. by you. But mm, I don't know. I like, like, they gotta, gotta go search around the house. <laughs> uh oh, I know you got one somewhere. I trust me. I got them somewhere. <laughs> now let's let's talk a little bit about this because growing up in New Orleans, it's mm -hmm. I mean it's almost iconic that you play the trombone, right? It's it's New Orleans. It is. Let's yeah, talk about just having all that music around you, not only in your family, just around you, everywhere you go. Yes, sir. Well, it's amazing because I tell people this all the time. You know, I've traveled pretty much every continent. It's in me and my brothers and stuff, because they're musicians too, and my uncles, except Antarctica, pretty much. And the thing about it is, I don't care where you are, if you're a New Orleans musician, that's the best place in the world for that training ground, where even if you're not the best musician in the world, say you average, you could make a full living playing music in New Orleans, singing or, or playing. I mean, a full living, never have another job, never have to work at Popeye's or Wendy's or, or Walmart. You could, you could live and buy houses and cars and have a family with music because New Orleans is the best, because it's literally everywhere. We have, what, hundreds of festivals a year, every single year? festivals, you have conventions. Like I said, everybody want to have their anniversary, their uh, for he's a jolly good fellow at weddings in New Orleans. And everybody want that New Orleans flavor of music and food. So uh, bands, they're just everywhere. They, they come up and the kids start them. I mean, we, we teach the kids, the young kids, of course, they get inspired. They see it's a good way to make money. It's better than making money on the streets, laying and stuff. So it is safer and, and stuff like that. So they start bands. We help them, the, the older guys. I mean, I was, I was one of those kids at one point. So um, then we start them out. And they, they, I'm mean, I say they're, they're all over the place. You can hire any band on a weekend. Like on average, if you're in a band in New Orleans, you're doing two, three to four gigs per weekend, sometimes during the week in the evenings. And you, have, you go to school the next day, or you teach, or you work, you go to work the next day, but you're doing gigs all the time. I don't get, whether it's a jazz funeral, or whether there's a, uh, like I said, a mock, a Mardi Gras parade in one of the big hotel rooms, or convention rooms, or whether it's through the French Quarter. Wow, wow. 
And so now as an educator, talk a little bit about the benefits of music. I, I we talked a little bit before, I, I was in a chorus my whole life, uh, still sing today. <clears throat> Some of you all may not be able to hear that nice melodious tenor <clears throat> oh, in my voice, but it's in there. But talk a little bit about the, the advantage of having students engaged in music education. Well, it's really a multitude of um, advantages that people don't recognize. I know people say, hey, okay, in curriculum-based instruction, academics, you hear people say, as a, as a bandmaster and educator, I hear people say, well, yeah, band is okay, they love band, doing good, but they're doing good, but academics come first. Well, I'm here to tell you guys that band, music, chorus, they all academics. Yes. I don't know who made the decision that science is more important than music because music is a science. Yes. I know. I don't know who made the decision and voted that that math is more important than music because music is math. Yes, it is. Music is art. Music is language. In fact, it's the only universal language in the world uh, that have existed. So, benefits: reading comprehension. Students reading learn all kinds of symbols in music that they wouldn't otherwise learn that they have to read quickly from left to right, just like regular language. And a lot of times reading text, you know, words and stuff on top of that, they have to be able to follow melodies, harmonies, bass lines. So you create a comprehension, it makes students stronger, make people stronger at reading in, uh, in, in their own languages. Um, let's see, we have teamwork. They learn the value of teamwork and learn how important it is, and that helps them later on in life. They learn better understanding. They understand things going on. They learn all just motor skills. They get better because we're doing many things uh, at one time. If you're a music student and you're learning, you're watching your director, the instructor, conductor. You also, at the, the whole time, you're reading the music the whole time. You're playing your instrument, whatever motor skills that you had to develop uh, to get stronger at your at your instruments because it's hand on. You're using fingers and hands and wind and air. You have to concentrate on all those things your diaphragm, your armature, your, your your neck. You have to concentrate on everything, air control. So using a mortar scales better and better and better. Um, it relieves stress. Um, my students, I've been teaching, this is my 24th year of teaching. I've learned that to come to the band room during the day or the afternoon is a stress reliever for them from things that's going on at home, also from things that's going on in school, from the uh, from the rigors of what everybody called the academic classes. Um, let's see, the building confidence. Um, when students playing or have to sing in front of their group, even if it's with like say two or three, a little section of, have to, of, of people, or one or two horn players or a drummer, or sometimes they have to do it individually, uh, that really builds confidence for them to be able to stand out and do things later on in life. If they have to do uh, make a presentation or uh, later on, like in higher education or at, in, a, in a work world, what we consider the work world, if they have to do uh, present something or even just in a meeting, stand up and speak. Yeah. Um, there's so many advantages that 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 you can think of that music as a, and also creativity, of course. Mm -hmm. Of course, even if you're not improvising, even not a, a rapper uh, making up uh, flows uh, to be able to freestyle, you still, in order to create a rap or if you, in order to create some lyrics or in order to create a melody, even if you're not doing the freestyle, you still have to write it down and put things down and make sure it matches up, make sure it resolves. And um, it's just so much. That's why I say it's a science as well, because uh, make no mistake about it, there are a lot of advantages for students to learn to be in music. And it's not any less important than history. Yeah. Because, because, because it's a part of history. It is. And it, it, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a couple things you said that just brought back memory. So I was that chorus kid. <clears throat> when I wasn't in class, after school and doing, I was in the chorus room all the time. That's it. I mean, I mean my chorus teacher was probably like my surrogate <laughs> father. I, I mean, I, I love that man, even to this day. The second thing is chorus taught me or music taught me so much just about history. 
because we 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 sang these period pieces and i had to understand in order to be expressive of the piece what it was talking about i mean today i know swahili from from singing songs in chorus right, right. So say jumbo i was like oh jumbo means hello in swahili yeah like, where did you learn that oh we just sing a chorus song in latin you have to learn a lot of latin and yeah. but see that that multitasking that students have to do in music is unlike any other discipline. Yeah. You have to do so many things at once. You have so many jobs at once. And yeah, and that person may be a little difficult, but once they start getting those things together, it makes other things in life uh, easier to do, uh, to multitask and also attention span. Yeah. You have to be able to pay attention. So a lot of benefits. Yeah, I really, I tell people all the time, you know, we, we are just now getting into performance tasks and all the other uh, disciplines. Music students have been performing forever. Right. Students involved in athletics, their whole, their grade is built off of a performance task. Exactly. So they're just now catching up. I want to look, I'm, I'm including myself in your world. They're just catching up to us. <laughs> that's, it. that's it. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I, I definitely, I always advocate for students to be engaged in music. So you said this is your 24th year as an educator. teaching. Yes, sir. I taught in elementary. Um, high schools, middle schools, and high ed. So I'm going to ask you this question, and this is going to be related to your education side of the many hats that you wear. Mm -hmm. What's one thing you wish you would have known earlier on in your career? I wish I've known more about, early, early on, about copyrights and copyright laws and performing rights, uh, performance rights because of royalties and stuff, because what most, I think most of the world don't understand is that those that do, they have a leg up, uh, meaning that they made the money. Yeah. Everybody see all the rappers and singers and, and artists out here that's doing well, and, they, and they, they, they're doing well financially, but if they're doing well, think about the people who are behind them who, are, who get all, all, all the residual income. Yeah. You see, I mean, and it's like, and, and they're getting serious money. Now, I, you can say the same thing probably for athletics, you know, the front office and the uh, agents and stuff like that. But just think of that. If, if, you, if you're if you managing so many artists, you're managing several, several artists, and you're getting percentage of everything that they do, almost everything they do, you, you're sitting pretty, you got some rollover income. So the thing is that copyright law, I was, a victim, as probably most people who are trying to do it on their own as a young person, of piracy, fraud, you know, a little bit of sharks come in and steal from you a little bit. So you don't know. You're signing things and you, you or you're not signing things. You're not copywriting things. You're creating things and people use it and put it out as their own. Yeah. And um, until you learn that, you, uh, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get basically dealt with in a negative uh, way. And then you hear your stuff on the radio. You're like, you know that it's yours. And you're like, well, who I shared it with? And it can, it's, it's always, it's somebody close to you. Mm -hmm. Somebody you do, who you say they're going to help you. Somebody who is a friend of yours, who you have uh, been doing the business with, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, or in a band with, they, a band or they went and started their own uh, band. Or it might be a family member. And like, it just, it's a cutthroat business. And, yeah. But but there, there are protections like copyright laws and stuff that you have to know about. Of course, I, I, I made myself learn a lot about more about that, you know, over all the years. But early on, that's the one thing. I'm glad you said that because this is going to lead me to a question that's really current right now. So in the world of social media, you have a lot of talented young kids out there. I mean, mm -hmm. super talented mm -hmm. who can just sing the house down they probably tearing somebody's church up it's just a natural singer right and right. a lot of these kids in order to put themselves out there are putting out original music on social right. media right and like you said later on they hear that same beat same lyric everything they hear it on the radio hmm. so what is the balance between expressing yourself and getting your music out there but also being safe to make sure that you're not being you no, know, you're not being robbed of your 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 creative property. Well, 
we have to find a balance, like you said. Um, and unfortunately, it's hard because social media is so plentiful. Social media is so out there. And you don't know what's what. Once it's out there, it's, it's out there. Even if you take it down, you think it's gone, but it's not necessarily gone. Um, I think in the world of technology, and, and trust me, I'm not I'm not a guru in technology yet. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I don't know if I ever become a, a guru in technology. There's so many different facets of it in streaming and piracy, um, seeking out the protections. Now, one thing before, you know, in my in my younger years. What, what we learned to do is what we call a poor, man, poor man's copyright mm-hmm. just to uh, actually protect ourselves with take like you know back in the day we had cassette tapes we take cassette tape and before you start performing it or before you put it out there in any form or fashion you perform it on uh, as best you could it could be a garage recording it doesn't have to sound like nothing but it just has to have the main you know elements in it mm-hmm. you put it on a cassette tape you put it in the envelope, you seal it up very, 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 very well. I don't care if you have to tape it up. You mail it to yourself with a date. And you got to have a postmark on it in any anyway. Inside that cause inside there on the sheet of paper too, you have in there the, the name of the work, who you are, you the author, and when uh what date you want on there. And you mail it to yourself and you never open it up. You never and you put it in a file. So at the time ever come. Uh, six years later, somebody else say, "I I made that. I made that in two thousand. I mean, in two thousand fourteen. But you have uh, evidence that you did it in two thousand six. Yeah, I mean, they they can't really uh, dispute that. Right. So that's one thing that that's that people could do. Uh, it still could work today if there's a way for them to put it down. Today, everybody's got a cell phone with a uh, with voice recording apps. Record it. Put it away." Some, some kind of way and to a place that you can prove when you did it. Yeah, that that's smart. And I, I don't know, like you said, that's got voice recordings. I mean, you can record yourself on Zoom and yeah. just save it to a file. This timestamp. So people out there watching, this man just told you this is we call it the poor man's copyright. copyright. That's it. And, and of course, that official type of copyright and stuff too that you get with the legal stuff at the Library of Congress. But poor man's copyright. Don't forget it. I, I started out started out doing it that way when I learned a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, and these kids, they just want to be discovered, right? That's just a goal. Like, if I can put it out there, somebody's going to discover me. But sometimes, if, if you ever get discovered before you do so, you've probably had 20 songs that have been stolen from you. Exactly. You well, once you, get in that, once you get in that ocean, you have to be aware of the sharks. Yeah. But you can't always see the sharks, and they're everywhere. Yeah. I believe I, I've heard so many stories about people, you know, stealing songs, stealing, stealing lyrics. But I've also hear on the other side, I've heard these artists who aren't just singers, they're writers, and they're selling their catalogs for millions of dollars. Exactly. Because people can't use their, these songs without their permission. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, and there, there are people in place, like I said, with the publishers and the performing rights organizations that uh, help with that, too, um, if you want to. You know, because their job is to find people to perform their artists to perform their artists' music or re-record their music. That's their job, and that helps their artists and them themselves get more money too. So let me ask you this other question. So, um, just in general, as an artist, as a musician, as an educator, um, what would you say has been one of your biggest challenges? Biggest challenges. Um, actually, the biggest challenge is actually. I would say just not knowing when um, when I got out there because excited when people started paying attention to me and my uh, friends and the other musicians that we were doing, we get excited. You know, everybody wants to perform for their event. Everybody wants to come perform their, at their place. So we perform it. And then you take it, people see you from other places and they uh, start sending you, uh, flying you around and driving around and on trips they use it for festivals and not knowing what you worked. So what happens is that you're taking these, you're signing contracts, you're taking these contracts that's really ripping you off and really like you're getting little to nothing. You're doing all the work in a lot of ways. You're the, you're the one sweating out there and uh, and working hard, but other people receiving more benefits and they're recording you and you're just happy that you 
category that an independent label or some mid-level label uh, working with you and got you some tours. My challenge was that um, not knowing and uh, what I was worth or how to navigate it once. If I, even if I knew what I was worth, I, would, worth, I wouldn't have known what to do with it. Yeah. So I needed these sharks. I needed these people. So I think that was the biggest challenge, like not knowing how to navigate that. So um, you, you need help. You need you need assistance. You need education. You need training. And, and unfortunately, I don't. It's not a. It's not a lot of that out there for people who just want to use their talents and uh in a yeah God given talent and put it out there. Yeah. So would you advocate for somebody getting a mentor, seeking out and finding a good mentor? Of course, mentors. What I ended up doing, you know, of course, I I graduated college. And I, I, I've been doing it for, I've been performing for a lot of years and making a lot of money, decent money, just performing and doing stuff and having fun, living, living the life. Yeah. However, I went out to college. I went, I mean, right out of college, I went, went into the military as an army officer, uh, commissioned officer in the United States Army. I spent a few years there and I'm watching everybody blow up and stuff that I used to perform with and stuff. So I went ahead and got out in the military. When I came back, I also, I was learning and watching everybody that blew up. I was watching them, you know, some level of fame and some level of stardom and some level of successes. But I was also watching the frustrations and the things that they were going through uh, with the business because they did, they all had their had a manager. Yeah, it would be hiring and firing different managers. They all had different uh, things. But they had ups and downs, a lot of ups and downs. And most of them were down when it comes to financially. And there a lot of frustration between group members and groups breaking up and all that. So what I decided, I said, I'm going to get my, you know, I have my own group. Um, like I said, it was mostly a, a family members and some friends. I had, I had two groups, actually. But this one particular group, for my namesake, Cool Bone, what I did, I got my, I got my two uncles. And my, four, my three brothers, I purchased a little handheld tape recorders. And when the phones, when they had the cell phones that did this at the time, <laughs> the handheld tape recorders got little notepads. And I went ahead and I did. Uh, I went and found uh, music business people and uh, to consult with. And I, I asked them how much for an hour of your time, mm -hmm. and can we come in? And we got two accountants that that uh, that did the business, and we sat with them and record. All of us record. Oh, you don't record them. I always take notes because sometimes I catch something and that you might not catch. You catch something I might not catch. Yeah. So what happens that uh, we did two accountants, you know, because we're trying to find out how to start the uh, at a corporation. We had an S corporation. We try to find out the LLCs, the publishing company, everything they wanted to do. My own little booking company agency time thing. And then I did uh, two publishers. I did two record company people. That, now, these record company people, they were at the highest, biggest companies at the time. It was like mid-level, but I got a lot of information. Uh, and these were, uh, one person was an artist repertoire. Uh, the people that, that's people that go out and look for the talent for the record companies. And another one was more so, and record company was like uh, more behind like the marketing and artwork and stuff like that. Uh, so I did two of those. I did two entertainment lawyers. One, one called... She called herself a music lawyer, music lawyer. Then the guy that I did, he, he was an entertainment lawyer. I did those two. I did two promoters. We even went to the clubs, went to the House of Blues in New Orleans, and also Tipitina's, and also uh, Howlin' Wolf. I sat, I would get with the producers, the production team, the production managers who do the stage shows every night. And they would, you know, I pay them to sit in with them. And then they started letting me come in all the time and watch what they do to set up the stages. And make the sound and do the sound checks and stuff like that. I would do the, I, then I went to a, two studios, the two um, most popular studios in New Orleans area. Did the same thing with uh, the engineers there and the owners. Um, and when we did that, then I also and I, I did that with with my 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 guys. Then I went and got these books to, to help me about the, the music business and stuff like that. Big thick books. And I just read through them and highlighted and stuff like that. And I educated myself. Um, that helped me a lot. Yeah.
So you literally went and learned the business top to bottom. Had to. Well, I didn't see no other way because I I was with the guys who got uh, who got taken. Now even the older guys who trained me, who taught me how to play the music, you know, who taught me the ins and outs of being on the road, um, they didn't understand the business side of it most times. Yeah. So and, it's uh, and, and, and I just watched these older guys get done into and ladies, and it, it wasn't a good it wasn't a good look. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about some of the stories from the 50s and 60s, how some of these super talented artists died broke. Mm -hmm. Music still lives on, but they didn't write. They were just singing. They died flat broke. But everybody knows their name. Right. Well, I'm going to tell you, in New Orleans alone, it's kind of different because you have a whole lot of popular hit songs that you watched, heard on movies and soundtracks all your life that you don't know that, you know, but you don't know the names of these New Orleans musicians. Cause they wrote it, they performed it, but big companies in the fifties and stuff took the, took it over. Let their artists perform it, so you know the art, the other artists y'all know the New Orleans artists. So New Orleans got both sides of it. So, wow. Um, let's go positive. What's your yeah. proudest moment? I'm sorry. What's your proudest I'm, moment? Okay, my proudest moment. Okay, I would say in the music industry, well, a couple of things. Got my doctorate, and um, <laughs> uh, so that, that was great. Uh, and also my master's, all in the same uh, area of the uh, areas of organizational management and organizational leadership. Because I'm proud of that. Because you know the human, the the, the people. That's that's the resource that really drives everything. Without those, you can't do. You know, can you, know, you can have all the uh, other materials in the world, but you, you need the, the the right people around you, that, that right network. You know, to to get things in motion the correct way. Right. So, so getting those degrees and also my music degree, but also I did that, um, we, I was able to lock down a major label, $2.6 million uh, record, recording contract with Walt Disney's Hollywood Records. Uh, I did that in 97. Walt Disney's had it, well, it started, the negotiations started in 1996. And I had a few actually major labels that was, they were kind of courting me. And I went with Hollywood Records. Well, Walt Disney's Hollywood Records, and we got out immediately. Unlike, um, very unprecedented, we, they gave us a, a big tour bus to be able to, you know, be able to do my thing. I was able to pick out whatever tour bus I want and lease it and ferry tour. Um, and I kept going with the same company, of course, that, that I liked. Um, we, went, we traveled around the world doing that. Now, we were already traveling overseas and stuff on, you know, with other promoters and stuff. But with this particular deal, I had uh, also, you know, locked in a a, a major uh, booking agent deal with one of the larger booking agencies, um, William Morris Booking Agency, and Kara Lewis. She's probably the most powerful agent in the world. She was my uh, exclusive booking agent. You know, everybody, you, most people you know, all the artists that you know, and comedians and actors, a lot of them are her. Uh, she's their agent, so I had that exclusive with her, and that, that relationship was great. And at the time, the editor chief of Billboard, uh, you know, Timothy White, he was one of my, he and I, we did everything. He came to all my shows at, at, on the East Coast. <laughs> and um, when he died and stuff, uh, passed away, they, they even came and got me to come and do a lot of stuff to talk about our relationship. You know, you know, he did, he put me on the front page a few times. Wow. Or, um, so that deal, you know, Polygram Records distributed us and, um, that, that was that was that was a great time, and we we were on the road. I would say out of three hundred sixty five days, we were probably out on the road uh, three hundred. Um, New Orleans was our home. The only times we saw New Orleans was when New Orleans was part of the uh, tour. Right. Wow. <laughs> wow. That that's big. That's big stuff. Um, big accomplishment. And I mean, I just love the fact that you here you are living this life, traveling the world. But also being humble enough to understand the importance of music education and being a, a public educator for tw over 20 years. I mean, you, you have lived several lives, young man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was very important. Um, you know, my 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 study for my dissertation was just about all of that, about the uh, uh, the perceptions. I, I, you know, I just I kind of got together with a lot of New Orleans, New Orleans musicians, mostly. I want to know their perceptions of, you know, the the, the training and resources and education in terms of entrepreneurial success. 
What's your perception of, are, are there resources? Are there a lack of resources? That's what I did everything on. And I intend to, you know, to continue forward with being an advocate in that area. Awesome. Uh, well, I appreciate you, you know, one, for what you're doing with the students. Two, thank you for your service in, in the Army. Mm -hmm. That's a choice you didn't have to make. And man, keep making music. Keep mm -hmm. making music. Um, so what's next for you? Well, um, I like to actually become that a, a coach and and mostly put in uh, do some uh, authorship. Okay. Um, and writing and books and and uh, possibly uh, some public speaking engagements, motivational in a way, in terms of um, helping to see if we could maybe not necessarily solve, but help the issues of matching up the uh, educational world with the uh, real life experiences. Because I'm gonna tell you, my, my brothers, my sister-in-laws, you know, all these musicians, they graduate in music in college. Uh, for example, my sister-in-law, she, she has, a, I think, a performance degree and a, for her undergraduate, but she also has a composition for her one of her masters. And But it, there was nothing to place her or to help her get a career. I mean, there's nothing, there, there's really no link yeah. to, to, to a career job unless she just wanted teaching. Of course, she went taught in college for a while. But outside of teaching music, there's really no link. There, there's nothing to train you really for that to be that real world publisher and, and see the ins and outs and the and the challenges that the publisher has on the day to day basis. Or that entertainment lawyer, or yeah, if you want to go to law, you could choose which kind of field you want to go to. But uh, publishers, artists, and repertoire, uh, or the, or the people that just deal with the art, or the people that deal with the merchandising in the music business, merchandising, or the club, the production, the 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 venues, the, the festivals. There's really, it's kind of like when you get out there, you graduate from high ed in music or just high school, and you're just out there and you're hoping to yeah. do something. You go on, even like um, somebody, like we do a lot of uh, casting, getting into the cast stuff, doing commercials and sometimes movies and stuff like that. Well, there's no training for that. Basically, you hear about the casting for this commercial, the casting for this movie. So you show up hoping that you can get in as an extra. Yeah, or possibly get a, a lead role, or they might call us because we're a band to to do some type of thing, uh, movies we've done that, and uh, and also commercials. But where's the training in schools? So there's there there's one school in Florida for full sale. That's what they're about. There are some other schools uh, that are starting to put some programs in place dealing with the music and the entertainment business to try to match up a little bit. Loyola University in New Orleans, Prairie View A&M, um, Beyonce and her dad, uh, the Knowles family, they, they helped you know, get something over there. I was on the board uh, for about two years at Southern University in Baton Rouge. We were trying to uh, get something established. Then it kind of disintegrated, so I don't know where they are with that. We lost touch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, but it's not enough. It's not enough. Yeah. So I really believe that there, there needs to be some other, some advocates, me and others, that really start putting our resources and our education, our training and experiences, yeah, uh, and going out there and really, and really trying to help uh, with that transition. The link, uh, kids transitioning from high uh, high school, seniors transitioning to college, so they can be successful that first year of college in in music, because that's a big part of it too. When they get to college. They can't handle that uh, because what they were learning in high school is not the same way that they treated in the college. Right. But then, what if they got a little success in college, transition from that to the real world and in a uh, career. And if they want to be an entrepreneur, or if they want to be a side man, or they whatever they want to do, be in a group. We need when there there needs to be some education, more education, and more training and more resources. I, I definitely agree. Well, listen. This is why we like having people like yourself connected to the Black Doctoral Network because you're a change agents and you work in the field, you have the expertise to know what to do to move things to the next level. And so talk a little bit about uh, your affiliation with the Black Doctoral Network and how it has enhanced your career or helped create relationships. Yes, sir. Well, 
I'm I'm fairly new to the network, but uh, I'm so glad to be a part of it, even like this with this podcast. Uh, it puts you out there uh, to you know, to the public and also to other uh, black doctors out there that that know the struggle, know that know uh, <laughs> that know what we need to be doing to help each other. We all have to uh, be advocates for each other. You know, there are challenges out there, you know, just by, you know, where we come from, the uh, cultures that we that, we, that we've lived in. And it's, more, it's kind of more challenging, more difficult for us to get recognized in some ways. Um, so I'm looking forward to actually uh, being more involved and, uh, and making myself available uh, as actually a part of the network to, uh, to assist and to also re- receive a lot of uh, ed- education and information. Um, and the, the network, I think that is one of the most positive things that I, I've ever uh, learned about because uh, in terms of with my terminal degree, because uh, I, I was researching, did a lot of research about it, and, uh, and I, I'm listening to successes before this podcast that they, you know, I've, I've learned, I feel like I know you already, Dr. Holmes, because I've seen you <laughs> conducting on uh, the interviews on several of the podcasts. And I, just those podcasts that you uh, conducted interviews on, you and some of the others, um, I've learned from listening to those people. Now, a lot of those fields, the, their, their, their expertise don't have anything to do with my expertise, but it taught me a lot about a lot of other stuff too. <laughs> and what you see is that, you know, we may be doing different things, but sometimes our stories are so similar. Similar, but, uh, yeah. That 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 what you have to uh, overcome. Yeah. More you know, challenges and stuff. But uh, we are here to promote their success. Yeah, most definitely. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. Um, it's been a true pleasure to have a fellow Georgia boy here yeah. with me. Uh, go dogs! For those of you that have watched the game, we are national champions. Um, so thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Dr. Stephen Johnson, will you please tell our viewers and our listeners where they can go to learn, learn more about you and the work that you're doing? Okay. At the very present, at the very moment, my uh, website is being under construction. You know, I've had the same website since the uh, late 90s, but uh, <laughs> www.coolbone.com. Coolbone is one word. C-O-O-L-B-O-N-E dot com is under construction only because I like to kind of manage and do everything myself instead of letting uh, designers do it. And um, and I had to change it. Everything getting too old. People started telling me, hey, you need something. <laughs> so uh, I was working on it, trying to have it up already. Uh, it'll be up by early next week, back up. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, it's right there on his shirt too, guys. Cool, yeah. but he's letting y'all yeah. know. <laughs> so check him out check him out uh he he, he is a master he's a master of music and he's doing great work uh thank you guys so much for joining us today for the black doctor talk podcast and don't forget to stay connected to the black doctor network as well on all of our social media channels it has been a great interview with dr stephen johnson and i hope you guys enjoyed it uh, we hope that you join us next time for our next podcast but for now be sure to like share, subscribe, and go on and tell one of your friends, tell your mom and your dad and your cousin and your uncle about the Black Doctoral Network and the Black Doctor Talk podcast. And we'll see you guys next time.